to ask me questions or do you want me to tell you the story? Tell the story. Tell the story. Yes. 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 Okay. I've read your book, but, but not it everyone would has take read a long it. time. <laughs> questions. We can get into it. We can ask questions yeah. after. It's a much better format. But it will take a long time. Oh, well, I don't want you to be... An hour and a half. Are you ready? Yes. yes. To listen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I wait for the lunch. I cannot yes, yes. the you time need to, I talk. You need fuel for your talk. Yeah, yeah I haven't eaten anything oh. yet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's about ten minutes. It's coming in ten minutes. It's coming in ten minutes. Oh, that's long. That's long. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Ten minutes? Then when the that stuff then I stop yes. and eat. Sure, there you go. Okay. Okay. I usually show a DVD. Can you do you want to listen? Okay. I usually show a DVD which lasts ten minutes and which is a very good introduction to my talk. So Having no introduction, I have to give you some details. <laughs> I was born in 1920. That means I'm 97 years old. I will be 98 in April. <laughs> and I was born in a very orthodox Jewish family. That means we were very religious. But I revolted at the age of 12 because I knew how to read Hebrew, but I didn't understand it. And I did not want to pray, not knowing what I was saying. So I asked to learn the Hebrew text, that means what, the, what we call the Torah. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, only the boys do that. Mm -hmm. Because that was how things were in 1930. Okay, 1932, when I was 12 years old. So I revolted, and I refused to pray in Hebrew. I started praying in French, because then I understood what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And I told my mother, it's absolutely uh, hypocr uh, hypocritical to, to, to pray in a language you don't understand, because you don't know what you're saying, you think about other things. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So, that's how I revolted. And I became a vegetarian too at that age. I had a lot of ideas. I was always thinking and reading a lot. And I was not a good student in school because I was reading instead of doing my homework. <laughs> so, but I managed well in life anyway. So. In 1939, we were very close to the German border. We were only 36 miles from the German border in my hometown of Metz, which is in Lorraine. You have heard all of Alsace-Lorraine. There are two provinces which are always sighted together because the historical fate was the same. You can ask me questions later if you want to know more about that. And, but they are very different provinces. In Alsace, for example, they speak a German dialect, Alsatian. In Lorraine, in most of Lorraine, they spoke French. But in the department of the Moselle, of which my hometown of Metz is the capital, we could, uh, may, my parents could not speak French because it was forbidden by the German. In 1870, the Prussian army of Kaiser Wilhelm I and the General Bismarck invaded France and they went as far as Paris. They never entered Paris like the Germans did in 1940. But they laid siege to Paris, and nobody, um, and the people had no food, and were starving. So the French government wanted the Germans to go back to Germany, to Prussia. 
but Russians ask that the French government give them all of Alsace and the department of the Moselle, of which my hometown of Metz is the capital, and in Alsace and in the department of the Moselle. During the whole war, it was forbidden to, during that whole period, from 1870 to uh, November 11, 1918, the end of World War I, it was forbidden to speak French. But, uh, so my parents spoke only German, and they spoke a very good German. When I was born in 1920, less than a year and a half after the end of World War I, my parents, I was number five, my parents had not had time yet to, to learn French, so I learned German from them. But my oldest brothers and sisters were already in the French school learning French and I learned French from them, so I learned both languages together. I was bilingual since my birth, oh, since I started talking. <laughs> so, to explain to you why I spoke German. And in 1939, when there were huge rumors of a possible war, the government of Metz, my hometown, the prefecture, which is a representation of the president of the Republic of France uh, in the region, asked that all people who could travel on their own should go to an assigned city. They had a program for many, many years before where all cities and all villages in the east close to Germany had a city or village assigned way in the west of France, far away from the German border. So we were assigned to Poitiers. Who read my book? How many of you read my book? Three, four. No, okay. I read it. You read it? Yes. Yeah. You read it? Yeah. Okay. So you have already some knowledge of what I am talking. So the prefecture asked us to go to Poitiers. We went to Poitiers. My, my two brothers were in the French army. My oldest brother was in the, uh, in the Maginot Line, which was a huge underground fortress uh, built from the, from the border of Switzerland to the border, border of Belgium. So all along the Rhine, which divided us from Germany. And my second brother was in Tunisia. He was doing his military service. So we were at home. My parents, my grandmother, my grandfather who had been a rabbi in Metz. You know what the rabbi is? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yes. It's not, I tell you, it's a priest of the religion. And he was one of the rabbis in Metz, a very orthodox, that means very, very pious. And uh, my great, he died in, in April 39, a few months before the beginning of the war. So my grandmother lived with us since then. And we had, and my three young, my oldest sister, Cecile, and my three younger sisters, Stephanie, Ellen, and Rosie. You all know them by my book. Yes. And we had with, uh, with us a little boy from Germany. Please do not talk when I come that disturbs me in a I am sorry, but I'm very fussy about it. Okay, so my... Uh, yeah, my, 
Jackie was a little boy from Düsseldorf, from Germany, a cousin. In 1938, his mother called us from Düsseldorf to ask us to come and get the children out. She had two small boys. Jackie was three years old and Josie was two years old. She was very pregnant with a third child. And that was after Kristallnacht in 1938. I don't know if you know about Kristallnacht. That was the first time that there was a huge uh, battle against the Jews in Germany. And the father was able to, uh, to uh, they wanted to arrest him, but they didn't arrest him immediately, so he, uh, he escaped to Holland. And the mother was hidden by a maid who was not Jewish in Germany until she delivered her children, her uh, little girl. Uh, but the two boys, my oldest brother and my oldest sister, traveled to Germany to take the children out and brought them. Jackie lived during the whole war with us. His brother, who was two years old, lived with one of my aunts. They both survived the whole occupation. Uh, Jackie is now in Israel. He's a very successful professor of engineering in a university there. And he's very successful professionally. And he's married, there's three children and eight grandchildren. So you see, it was worth saving him. His brother survived the occupation in France, but once in Israel, he, he died as a soldier during the Six Day War. He, he was 32 years old when he died. So that's a story. So I go back to our story. We were now in Poitiers. We started the store because we did not want to be on the rolls of the government, because the government paid for all the people who had been um, evacuated from the east of France and sent to the west. But we started the store so that we do not need the government to keep us on the door. And the store was closed by the Germans very fast because the Jews had no more right to, to, to have stores. And then I became a secretary at the French uh, city hall in the, uh, in, in the requisition, requisition Office, that means we had to give to the Germans whatever they asked. And I was a translator there because I knew how to speak German fluently. So there too, I was thrown out of the job by the Germans. Military, three military policemen came in. They were all over six feet tall. They had huge metal plaques on the chest while by a chain. And we called them the dogs on leash to make fun of them because of the chain. And they came in with bayonets, with rifles and bayonets to get us out because we were from Metz, three young women who spoke German. There were nobody in, in the Poitiers who spoke German but us. So, we lost, so I lost that job. <laughs> After that, I went to become a nurse in the school, in the Red Cross School of Nurses. And there, things became worse and worse. After the German started the war with the Russians in 1941, and things became much, much worse for the Jews and for the French non-Jews too. And there were rules. We had no more the right to, 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 
to go to any public space. We had identity cards with the stem Jew, which made us absolutely targets any time they wanted us as targets. And we had no right to go, for example, to a train station, we couldn't go to a post office, we couldn't go to a public park, we couldn't go to the river to, to swim, we couldn't go to a, to a movie house, we couldn't go to any public space, and we couldn't go to buy food in the stores until 4.13 in the afternoon, and we had a window of one hour. And all the shopkeepers, because at that time there was no supermarkets, there were only mom and pop shops. <laughs> all the shop owners told us, we know what you are used to buy. Don't worry. We will put aside for you what you need. Come at 430 and we will get whatever you need. And as long as we were in Poitiers, we were never deprived of anything. So I'm stopping now to eat and then I go on. Thank you. Thank you. Shopkeepers were putting aside our food. And that was punished by death if they were caught by the German. It was punished by death of the person and every member of the family. And they did it to help us regardless of the danger. And that's why we survived. Because so many people in France lost their lives to save ours. So that's an extremely important information that I am giving you because it's very little known in America. In France, 75% of you survive because so many people risk their lives to save us. And entire villages had Jews in every family and the mayor was making them forge papers so that the children can go to school. And they continue to be trained and they all survive. All these youths who were in these villages survived. So 75% of Jews survived in France. There is only one other country in Europe where more Jews survived the occupations of the Germans. That was Denmark. But in Denmark, the fishermen <coughs> took the Jews by boat to Sweden, which was a neutral country. And they all 95% survived. 5% refused to go. They were too old or they were sick. And they were all arrested and deported and never came back. So, <coughs> And in Denmark too, the fishermen risk their lives and that of every member of their family to save the Jews. But Denmark is a very small country and very flat. So the, they could never have hidden the Jews. In France it was different. We had a lot of mountains, we had a lot of beaches, we had a lot of rural Places. And I told you there were entire villages where Jews were hidden and not one person in these villages denounced them. Not one. And all these people survived. And so many other people helped us at the risk of their life and that of every member of the family. And that's my mission, to let people know how much we were helped in France by non-Jews. So, um, I tried to. You're eating, you're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> because my husband is my front dog, and he puts me back on track when I'm off. Okay, sister. Yeah, okay. Um, my, 
one of my sisters, Stephanie, and I, she was only 16 months younger than I. We saved hundreds of people in Poitiers. These people rang our bell. We did not know who they were. We did not know what, from where they were coming, but they needed help. And the help consisted of crossing between occupied friends and non-occupied friends, because friends were separated in two. Three quarters of friends were occupied by the German army, but one quarter was under the government of Marichal Pita, who was a Marichal of World War I, very well known for Werner, for the battles of Werner. <coughs> and like you in America, like Eisenhower, the French like Peter, because he had been successful in Werner. And in 1940, when the Germans invaded France, everything was so chaotic that Peter took the government without being elected. We were a, a democracy like America, and all our president, presidents were elected, but Peter was never elected. And until 1942, the French, many French, followed P Peter because they thought they would save France against the Germans. But in 1942, it became very clear to most of the people that Peter was collaborating 100% with the Germans and uh, not helping the French at all. He was a very old man and he had terrible AIDS. There is a resemblance of what's going on here right now. But uh, he, he, was, he was an extremely selfish person, Peter and that was known in the army. And I never believed in him because I told you I read a lot and I, very young, I read a book by Marie-Charles Foch, a Joffre, I don't remember which one, who said that to make Peter move, you had to give him a kick in the bottom. <laughs> he used a much more vulgar term. <laughs> and, and that showed me that Peter was not what people believed. But anyway, Peter was a very old man. At the end of the war, when the French and the Allies all together uh, made the German leave France, <coughs> Peter was arrested and put in prison. And he died in prison. He was never released because he was a traitor to France, to give him an idea of what was going on in France at that time. So we were in Poitiers, and I told you that all these people came to our house and rang our bell to ask us to help them. How they got our address, we never knew. We didn't ask questions. At that time, nobody asked questions. But if people needed help, you help them, for most people. So we sent them to a, a farmer, Noel de Gou, in DNA, which was an hour by car from Poitiers. But in 42, France had no more gasoline, we had no more cars, so people had to walk or to take a bus. A, you know, a city bus. And Mr. De Gou had a farm which was partially in occupied France and partially in non occupied France. So, once on his property, it was very easy to go from one sector to the other. And he was very clever. The Germans had suspicions that he was helping people. He had thousands of people. But 
he was so clever that they never had any evidence. But my sister Stephanie made a big mistake. She signed her name to a letter she wrote to Mr. De Goo to send him a voucher for cigarette that a young man who had crossed on Mr. De Goo's farm into non-occupied France had forgotten in our house. If you had a voucher for cigarettes, you needed it if you smoked to buy cigarettes or tobacco. If you didn't smoke, you used it to barter it against food because food was already scarce all over France because the Germans were stealing everything we had. So, my sister, made some big mistake by signing her name and the Germans in 1940, as soon as they entered France, several weeks later, made all the fa Jewish fathers come to City Hall on a certain day and register their whole families. So the Germans had the list of all the Jews in the occupied France. We had no computers at the time, luckily. So everything was sent us, but they had the list. So they found immediately the name of my sister and came and arrested her in our home at dinner time. And they took her to, the, to their office. In my book, I wrote that she was arrested by the Gestapo. The Gestapo was a unit <coughs> The best known, which, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It, it, it was the police unit, the best known, which served the American, uh, uh, which served, now I have, uh, uh, just a minute, I have to get my ideas together. So, where is my, oh, where is my husband? No, he has to be here. <laughs> He has to be next to me so that he helps me. I understand. Yeah, he can sit here. I will sit there yeah. with you just ask yeah, him. <laughs> no, but he can take another shot. <laughs> okay, I go back to my story. Do you know that's where I need him when I go back to my story? You were talking about the Gestapo. What? <laughs> the Gestapo. <laughs> The Gestapo gentleman. Yeah, taking your sister. Yeah. Taking so your sister. the Gestapo was a police unit, the best known, which served, <coughs> thank you, which served um, the, uh, the German army and the German <coughs> government. And when they come to your house to arrest somebody, they don't tell you to what police unit they belong. So we thought it was the Gestapo. But years later, I did some research for Yad Vashem, which is a museum in Jerusalem. It's a Je museum of Holocaust in Jerusalem. And I found out that my sister was not arrested by the Gestapo, but was arrested by the Zippo. S-I-P-O. Just initials of a very long war. Because the Germans like to take one word next to the other and make a long word. <laughs> and they love to do that. And uh, the, he didn't come back yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Where was that? You were describing the Zippo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Zippo was. Uh, created by a decree signed by Hitler in March 1942. My sister was arrested June 17, 1942. To show you how efficacious the German army was, the decree signed in March. In June 1942, they are already in all occupied countries of Europe by the German army and arresting people. And they probably arrested people before they arrested my sister. She was arrested, like I told you, because we had helped people and they found a letter. And 
they took her to the office and questioned her, and she refused to give any information because any information she would have given was denouncing the Mr. De Gaulle. So two hours later, they came back to the house and arrested my father to put pressure on my sister to give them the information. And even in the presence of my father, she refused to give any information. So she was released, and my father was released because the Germans had not yet started in June 1942 in Poitiers to arrest French Jews. Nothing was centralized like I told you before. We had no computers yet. So they, the Germans got orders and they applied them when they wished to do it. So they had not yet arrested French Jews. They had arrested only foreign Jews. You all know, and right now, it's a very important uh, issue that any time economic or uh, political problems arise, the foreigners are the first target. And that was then and it's now, all over the world. So, the foreigners were all in a, the Jewish foreigners were all in a camp on the fringes of the city of Poitiers. The camp was called the camp of the route of Limoges. Limoges is the city south of Poitiers. You can all Google it and find the, the camp of the route of Limoges. It's on Google and see what they say about it. So, <laughs> my father was released, as I told you, so he, he never was arrested. So my sister spent one month in prison. She celebrated her 21st birthday on July 10th, 1942, in prison. And after that month of prison, she was sent to the camp. She was the only French Jew in the camp. And she was a medical student. So she started to give medical care to the children in the camp. And when we, the family, organized that she escapes, we had found two French guardians who accepted to help her escape. She refused because she felt that what she was doing for the children was too important. So, that's her. That's her. So, in... Where was I? Uh, two guardians. Yeah. So, once in prison, we could not visit her. But in, in the camp, one person of the family could go once a week. One week, I went to see her. And I reminded her that her mother needed her as much as the children. And she answered me, don't you realize that if I escape, you are all going to be arrested? I had never thought about it. So on my way back home, I decided, I had a very long walk, I decided that we were, that all the members of my family still at home would escape into non-occupied France so that Stephanie can escape too. And we may managed this. If you read my book, you know, and that was the most beautiful human story you can imagine. That's why it's so important to read my book. But she was never able to escape. And after that month in prison, she was transferred to the camp where, where oh, I told you that, I think. She was transferred to the camp. <coughs> 
I'm to take care of the Yeah, I see that. Okay, she went to Strozzi. So um so she was never able to escape after we escaped. And she was later transferred to Drancy, an approach of camp near Paris, and then to Pitivier, which wasn't better. And she was deported all the time. And she was deported to an unknown destination on On September 21, 1942, she could not write to us. There was no possible communication between occupied and non-occupied friends yet. So she wrote to a friend in Poitiers, and in her last, in that last letter she wrote, in the postscript she added, at the last romance, we are leaving for Metz our home to work, so no need to dramatize. These are the last words she ever wrote because later, years, years later, we found out that she had been deported to Auschwitz and she never came back. So I like to honor my sister before I tell my own story. But I have to go back to that to that issue of help from the non-Jews. Several weeks before my sister is, um, was deported, uh, was arrested, I had met in the main street of Poitiers, Mr. Charpentier, with whom I had worked on sit in the city hall of Poitiers. And Mr. Charpentier stopped me took me to a very quiet place on the street and told me, I am now in measure to provide you with identity cards without the stem shoe. And that was life saving. And I told him, Mr. Charpentier, you cannot do that. You are risking your life, that of your wife and little boy. I had seen pictures when we worked together. <coughs> and he answered me, if I didn't help you, I could live with myself. And I asked him how much it would cost. I was 21 years old. He was, no, 42, that I was 22 years old. And he was, um, and he started crying when I asked him how much it would cost. I was 20 year, 22 years old. I had never made a man cry yet, so I was very embarrassed. <laughs> and, and Mr. Charpentier told me, I do not want any money. I want to save you. And he provided me with an identity card for all members of my family still at home. And for my sister Stephanie, because we hoped she could escape too. And without that card, we couldn't go anywhere. But with these cards, we were able to cross into non-occupied friends successfully. So now um, <clears throat> I was in non-occupied friends, like I told you, and I continued my studies of nursing I had started in Poitiers. I, Jews had no right to be in school. And, but in Poitiers, as well as in Marseille, I was accepted knowing perfectly that I was a Jew. And I finished my studies, I graduated, and I decided to go to Paris, to live with my older sister, who lived in Paris since 19, the end of 1940. After we got the cards with the stem Jew, she went to Paris. She was much taller than I. Mm -hmm. She was very good looking and very elegant. 
she went to the police and told them she had lost her car. Mm -hmm. And without any questions, they made her another car without the damn shoe, of course, because they never asked her what she was. Mm -hmm. And that's how she was able to live in Paris during the whole occupation. And she survived the whole occupation in Paris. So I went to Paris to live with her, and I could not work for a hospital. I was already a registered nurse. I could not work for a hospital where I would have been asked too many questions. But I worked for an agency which asked no question whatsoever. So I worked, I helped people taking care of members of the family who were ill. And I did that during the whole rest of the occupation. And once Paris was liberated, I decided that I wanted to, to join the French army. And I tried to join the French army, which was very difficult because uh, thousands of people wanted to join the army. There was a huge column, and I was in line for many, several days before I reached anybody. And when I reached that person, who was a woman, she asked me immediately to show my identity card. So I showed the identity card forged by Mr. Charpentier. That was the only one I had, because our cards with the damn shoe we had left in our house in Poitiers, where we lived. So she looked at my card, and immediately she told me, that's a forged card. She probably had worked for the underground and the resistance in forged papers because nobody else had any doubts when looking at my car. And she said, we cannot, the army cannot accept it. She wanted my birth certificate. Paris was liberated in August 1944, but my hometown of Metz was only liberated in November 1944. So I couldn't get my birth certificate from Metz, that was impossible. So it's not point. I had to prove like everybody wanted to, to join the French army that I had not collaborated with the German army. <coughs> How do you prove something you haven't done? I couldn't. So <coughs> I joined the army only in November 1944 after Poitiers was liberated, I took the first train which functioned between Paris and Poitiers, and I went to see the mother of my fiancé, Jacques Delaunay, who had been executed by the German army. She was at home all alone when I arrived. Her two sons, my fiancé Jacques, who was a medical student, and his brother Marc, who was a law student, had been executed together on, on uh, October 6, 1943, in Mont the worst prison of Paris at that time. So she was, and her husband, who had been a resistant too, had been arrested and he was in concentration camp of Buchenwald in Bavaria. So she was all alone and very ill. I took her to Paris to live with my sister and myself and we provided her with the medical care she so badly needed. And once she was better, she met the French army in the cemetery where her two sons were buried by the German. And the cemetery was in a suburb of Paris in Ivry, I-V-R-Y. And the army asked her what they could do to help her. 
and she told them, I was with her, of course, she told them, Miss Hoffnung was a fiancée of my oldest son. She would like to join the army, but she doesn't have the documents necessary for that. Can you help her? In a few days, everything was done. The army called me and told me that I could join the army now, and I was assigned to the 151 Regiment of Infantry. The front in, Al in November 1944 was in Alsace, where I was not born, if you remember. So I was told to go to a certain place in, in Paris and find a bus which would take me to the front. I went there when on the bus, I was the only woman on the bus. There were only officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers who had come back on furlough to Paris and were now returning to the front. And we were in a very old bus which needed constant. So that officer asked me immediately what I had done during the resistance. And I explained to him that with my sister who had been deported and we had no news yet, we still thought she was alive. And we have lost hundreds of people. You had helped hundreds of people. Yeah, but I told him that I had helped hundreds of people to survive and sending them with my sister. We were working together to, to Mr. De Goo. Mr. De Goo, but that was never, I forgot to tell you, Mr. De Goo was never arrested and he got the title of Just Among the Nations from Yad Vashem the museum in Jerusalem in, in 2011. So that's another story. But anyway, I told the captain that we had uh, sent all these people to Mr. De Roo and we had saved them. And after my sister was arrested and deported, I continued to do things on my own. But I was never, never able to join a group of residents. Several times I was interviewed by chiefs of the residents in the attics of big buildings in Marseille and Paris, because that was ultra secret. And every time the chiefs of the residents looked at me, <laughs> You have all seen that I'm not very tall. <laughs> but I was taller than I'm now. <laughs> I was 4'11". I was very thin, very blonde, with blue eyes and a very light skin. And these chiefs looked at me and felt that I had absolutely no substance. <laughs> they took me for a bimbo. <laughs> And they refused that I enter the group. And I told that the captain, and he said to me, that's a lot of baloney, you should have gone in the streets and killed a German. Oh, and I answered, I am a nurse, I take care of people, I don't kill anybody, not even a German, who I hit. And he said to me, you see, you are not fit to be in the army. And he too wanted to send me back to my mother. I said, oh, no, I had enough trouble coming. So headquarters in Paris sent me, I'm going to stay. So furious, he told me, as a registered nurse, you should be an officer. But because you were such a coward during the resistance, I made you sergeant. And I just shrugged my shoulders because I couldn't care less. <laughs> and then, more furious by my attitude, he said to me, I do not need nurses. I have enough nurses. You are going to be a social worker. 
I was a trained nurse. I had not the slightest idea what social worker entailed. <laughs> but in the army, and that counts for all armies in the world, if they tell you you are a social worker, that's what you are. <laughs> so I left the office and went to the village or the small town where we were headquartered. And all the troops who were not at the front had a room in the village or that small town. So I got to my room, I slept all night. The next morning I put on the American uniform I was given. I told you all our resources, even uniforms, uh, food came from the American army. So that uniform was much too big for me. They had no uniform my size, but it was warm. And that was very important because the winter of 1944, 1945 was particularly cold. And we were near the Vosges Mountains where it was even colder. So I put on my uniform and then I wondered what I should do because nobody gave me any orders of what I should do as a social worker. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to visit our troops at the front. I inquired, I left the village in a certain direction, crossed a small forest, and found our troops near a canal. Our troops were on the western side of the canal. The German had retreated several days earlier on the eastern side of the canal. I, I entered the foxholes of our troop. They were very surprised. They had never <laughs> seen a social worker in their foxholes. <laughs> so I asked them what they needed, and they requested underwear, socks, <coughs> hats, scarves, blankets, food, reading and writing material. I would go back to the village and the Alsatian villagers were extremely generous and gave, us a, gave me a lot of things for our troops. And that I did for several weeks. Then one day, crossing the square of the village where we were headquartered, I met the colonel of the regiment. It was Pierre Fabien. In 1943, we all heard that a resistance had killed the first German at the metro station Barbès Rochechouart in Paris in 1943. But nobody knew the name of the resistance that was, was highly uh, re secret too. But <coughs> when I joined the regiment, I very quickly learned that the re colonel of the regiment was a resident who had killed the first German <coughs> in the metro station by Metro Chouchois. There is now a metro station in Paris bearing the name of Pierre Fabien. And Pierre Fabien stopped me and asked me to answer his phone during his lunch break. I went with him to his office. He showed me around and leaving. <coughs> he was very good looking, which doesn't help anything. <laughs> he was very, and he was very courteous. And he said to me, I am sorry, there is nothing for you to read here. There are only German books. <laughs> and I answered, I read German fluently. <laughs> so extremely interested, he walked back towards me and asked me if I spoke German. And I said yes, as well as French. So he explained to me that in Germany, all the males from the age of four to all age <coughs> are in uniform in the army. So any male in civilian clothes, walking the streets of Germany, 
would be immediately arrested, uh, noted and arrested. And that's why they needed women to do that type of work. And he asked me if I accepted to be transferred to the to the intelligence service of the army. I accepted. He left. I sat on a chair and wondered. I wondered what. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you wondered what you just did? What, <laughs> <laughs> I will get it. You sat on I the went, chair? I wondered in what predicament I had put myself, but it was too late. I had given my word. So two, three days later, I was picked up by the intelligence officers and taken to Mulhouse, a city in Alsace, where I underwent an extremely intensive training for what I was going to do. And, uh, and after the training, I was asked to devise my own alibi because that would stick much better. And I did it. And uh, I presented the alibi, it was accepted. I was now assigned to the commandos of Africa, a regiment coming from North Africa, like all regiments in the army, French army. And I was very flattered to be assigned to such a regiment. And Colonel Bouvet, who commanded the commandos of Africa, asked me first to, uh, to uh, question uh, officers of the German army to learn what was the plan of retreat of the Germans from Alsace to Germany. We were now in January 1945. The Germans had contra-attacked in North Africa, <coughs> in uh, Belgium, in the winter of 1944, and they lost their battle uh, just before Christmas 1944. But in, in January 1945, the Germans were counter-attacking again, but coming through Strasbourg. And all our armies, the French and all the Allied armies, had to, uh, to leave and go west, quite a bit west, <coughs> to wait for, the, for that counter-attack to be uh, taken care of. And that took several weeks. That was in 45, in the beginning of 45. The Germans were desperately fighting to prevent the French army to invade Germany. Not the French army, the Allied armies, to invade Germany. And that was the last, last chance. Sorry. So, I interrogated generals and colonels, and they were, um, they had a lot of trouble giving me information, but I obtained extremely important information, and I can boast about it, because it's that medal, which is a croix de guerre. You see, there are two citations. In one of the citations, it is written that I provided Colonel Bouvet with extremely important information about the retreat of the German from Alsace to Germany. That was my first achievement in the army. Then, after that, I was asked by Colonel Bouvet to cross the front in Alsace, not yet in Germany, but in Alsace. And 13 times I tried to cross the front and I was unable to do it because there were many reasons. 
during the war things are very changed very fast. Everything is very fluid. And I was told to go to a certain place where I would find certain things. When I arrive there, I cannot find it, so I cannot proceed. Another reason, there are many reasons, but another reason, so we have military guides who explains to me, explain to me, they know the region very well, and they explain to me how to go from A to B and <laughs> what I will find on the ground and how to proceed. But they are humans and they make mistakes. I give you an example. One night, very late, I, I was always taken very late at night. At 12 o'clock, I was taken by jeep to a certain place in Alsace. The jeep stopped near a huge field covered with snow. We were in February 1945. And I told you it was a very cold winter and very snowy. So the jeep stopped and the two officers who were with me told me that I have to cross the field and go northwest of the field to a small town where a small group of German military people are going to retreat, but still in Alsace, not yet in Germany. So I left them. I had only a small suitcase with clothes. I had taken all the labels up, so nobody knows they're coming from France. And, and I had no compass. I had no radio. I had no map. I had no arm. I had nothing written. Everything I needed to know was in my memory. So I left and I started walking on the field on the dark night, in the dark and cold night. And suddenly I heard a huge crack and I felt myself completely submerged in ice cold water of the canal. The guide had forgotten to tell me there was a canal in the field. Mm -hmm. I popped up and tried to get out of the canal, which was very narrow, like all man-made canals. But I couldn't get out, because everything was so frozen that I couldn't grasp sufficiently. And I was now heavier, because I was completely drenched in that ice-cold water from head to toe. So it took me a long time to get out of the canal. You must understand that I couldn't call for help because that was absolutely not possible. I had to do it on my own. So I finally found a place where I was able to grab sufficiently and I got out of the canal. And I walked all night. I never caught a con. And the next morning at daybreak, I noticed that my prints of the, my little boots showed that I had walked in circles oh. all night. And years later, I read in a magazine that by a cold night, uh, by a dark night, if you have no compass and no, no other mark, you are going to walk in circles. Mm. That explained why I had done that very weird thing I had never understood. <laughs> so after that, <coughs> the captain who directed our intelligence service, our small group, decided that I was going to go into Germany <coughs> And I... <coughs> But Switzerland was neutral. But during the war, when the Germans were successful, the Swiss helped them. Now we were successful, the Swiss were helping us. I mean, all the Allied armies. That's neutrality. So I was taken by one of our officers to 
Basel, where I met again, I had met him before, <laughs> Colonel Reinhardt, it's a pictured name, <coughs> who was the chief of the Swiss intelligence of the customs in Basel. And Colonel Reinhardt accepted that I cross into, into Germany <coughs> and he called the nation, Mr. Le Maire, to take me to the border. Mr. Le Maire took me by car to Schaffhausen, which was where there are enclaves, several enclaves, that means that the Swiss territory <coughs> juts into Germany. And we arrived by car and we stopped near a small, uh, near that enclave, uh, near a small forest. We got out of the car and, uh, and we left uh, and we crossed the forest. And on the other side of the forest, Mr. Le Maire showed me a huge field covered with snow. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost. He uh, showed, you showed a me field. Another, another field which was bordered on the <coughs> northern edge by a country road. So, the forest and the field were Switzerland, but the road was German. And the road had no barrier whatsoever. You could walk on the, from the field onto the road. But the road was under the surveillance of two German army uh, sentinels, were heavily armed, which came from the eastern edge of the width of the field, walked to the center of the width of the field, so other sentinel came from the west, met him, they talked to three seconds, turned their back and walked to the edge of the field. And they were doing that constantly without stopping. And Mr. Le Maire told me towards the evening, when it's still light, daytime, you, I will tell you when to go and you will crawl along the field when both sentinels have separated and turned their back to you, walking to the edge of the field. And when they come back and separate again, turning their back to you, you walk on the road, you walk towards the east, towards the right, towards the sea. That was the first city in Germany where I was supposed to go. So we stayed all afternoon in that forest. Mr. Le Maire was a middle-aged man. I was 24 years old. And he talked to me about his wife and children and other things. But in the afternoon, with a very strange smile, he said to me, you may be killed tonight. Why don't you, don't we have a good time now? <laughs> but that was not on my agenda. <laughs> so after that, well, <laughs> after that, we, uh, we talked about all kinds of things and towards, at the, towards the end of the day, but it was still very day, daytime. He said, now is the time. So I took my little suitcase where I had all my clothes without labels, like I told you, and I had no compass, no radio, no arm, no map, nothing written. Everything I need to know was in my memory. But I had now two new things. I had vouchers for everything I needed in Germany, for buses, for car, uh, for trades, for hotels, for restaurants, for food, for anything I need to buy, I had vouchers. And I had a lot of German money hidden in my suitcase. And when Mr. Le Maire told me, now is the moment, 
I took my little suitcase and I started to crawl along the field and I hid behind the bushes without trouble. Until then, everything was perfect. But once behind the bushes, I suddenly realized the immensity of what I was going to undertake. And I became so terrified that I was completely paralyzed by fear. <coughs> and it took me a very, very long time to overcome that fear. Something clicked in my brain. I remembered something which suddenly made me get up, take my little suitcase and walk on the road and uh, call, uh, meet the German soldier who was coming back from the eastern edge. I left my right arm highly low and he asked for my identity card. I was now called Marta Ulrich, and I told you I had a whole <coughs> alibi. So he looked at my card, and I wondered if he too would recognize that it was a forged card. But he gave it back to me. I was now in Germany. I will end up, because I have no more voice. In Germany, I found extremely important information. You have to read my book to, to see. Mm -hmm. But the two things, uh, I told you that I had found already uh, the information of the generals and colonels. Um, no, you found Siegfried Line. Well, the Siegfried Line. Yeah, I know that. But I repeat that uh, what I found with the with, uh, generals and colonels I had interrogated. That I, I, had give, I told you what I had found then. But in Germany I found that the Siegfried Line was completely evacuated in the region of Freiburg. That meant that our armies had not to fight the Siegfried Line which was an extremely uh, difficult project. In the northern region of the Rhine, when the Americans entered Germany, they bombarded the Siegfried Line three weeks, night and day. And even so, that it's so intensely bombarded, they lost a lot of men fighting the Siegfried Line which was an underground <coughs> fortress and extremely difficult to find. So I found that the Siegfried Line had been completely evacuated by the German army. That meant that our armies did not fight it, did not need to fight it, but could occupy the south of Germany much faster and terminate the war much faster. And I found too that <coughs> the, look, where the remnant of the German army was hidden in ambush in the Black Forest waiting for the Allied armies. And that's why, uh, having given that, this information to, the, to our French army, which gave it to the Allied armies. That's why I got all these medals. Thank you very much.